Zurich University. I'm in the Department of Mathematics, Applied Mathematics and Statistics. Um, so I'm going to talk today about the biology and information theory, which is somehow a different topic. Um, but th these are things that I've been interested in for a long time, and I uh, have very much enjoyed working with Andrew, both to put the conference together and to, uh, to work on some problems at the intersection of information theory and biology. Um, Andrew gave a, a nice uh, overview well, of many things, um, but uh, partly also of the, uh, the early history. And I just wanted to point out that um, uh, some of the, the issues about the optimality of information measures are uh, sometimes we get into trouble when we consider them in isolation of the larger biological picture. That's a theme that I'll come back to in the rest of the talk. I just want to point out that you could add to the, uh, the history um, even before Wiener. So uh, the first edition of Norbert Wiener's book, Cybernetics, came out in 1943. And if you look in chapter three, he's talking about the logarithmic measures of information um, that everybody was talking about at that time. Um, here we go. Here's the P log P formula. Um, there's a footnote that says he, this was pointed out to him by his, his friend John von Neumann. So, uh, and if you look, I, I've been um, thinking also about not just information theory but control theory recently and looking at some of the early sources from the 60s. Uh, the people who are doing systems engineering and thinking that you should be able to apply systems engineering ideas to biology the people who founded systems biology, the, the first use of that term was actually at a conference at Case Western in the 60s. Um, they were thinking about problems like state estimation. If you want to apply control, you have to measure the state of the system. So the information problem and the control problem were intimately combined, part of the same problem at the beginning. Uh, somehow we've, we've followed Shannon's lead by focusing on syntactic structure and taking, you know, looking at the information processing properties aside from the control problem that the information is being used to accomplish. I think when we go back to biology, we, we forget to, that there's a, some sort of a, a role that the information is playing, and it might enrich our understanding if we can put those back together somehow. I'm not sure how to put that back together, and that's not the topic of the talk. That's just something that, I guess, a response to, to Andrew's historical comments. So let me go on with the talk. Um, so uh, glossing over that, that idea that we shouldn't just be looking at information, <laughs> well, although I will come back to that at the end of the talk, uh, the object that we are interested in for any given system, that what quantifies uh, how much information it can carry, uh, is the channel capacity. And so that's the maximum of the mutual information over all the possible ways that you could set up the input ensemble. So here's the classic diagram. Um, so the question is, um, uh, uh, what does this have to do with biology? And as Andrew mentioned, there are quite a number of success stories, particularly uh, at least the ones that I'm the most familiar with in the realm of sensory processing. So this is a diagram from a paper by Tony Bell and Terry Sanofsky from 97, um, where, can you see that well enough, or should we turn the lights down a little bit on the stage? It's legible. Is that a little? Okay. Um, so what they did was they, uh, they and other people at the same time were doing work where you take an ensemble of images collected from natural scenes and then you uh, apply an information theoretic criterion to try and optimize the representation, either to get the most informative representation or the sparsest representation. And uh, the, the sorts of filters that uh, came out after doing this optimization procedure look like this. They're oriented, they're compact, and they tend to be like little... Uh, little plus minus bars lined up next to each other in different orientations. That's just what the receptive uh, fields look like for simple cells in the visual cortex. So uh, this, this is tied closely to um, or inspired by Barlow's redundancy reduction ideas, um, where you, you say, look, we can explain some aspects of the structure of sensory physiological systems <coughs> in terms of an information theoretic principle. Question? Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I know both Tony and Terry very, very well. One thing bothers me about the picture. My, my feeling is that most of those boxes should have nothing in them. That's what happens when you look out there. There's no, you know, the, the big green board is all green and the big brown uh, wall above it is all brown. And most of that has none of these, these transitions. Right. These, these transitions are very important, but they're not. These, they're these, not are, the, these are the filters that you then apply to a visual scene. So if I took a snapshot or a picture of the board, yeah. Most of these would be orthogonal to that image. So on any given presentation, most of them would be zero. 
It's the representation of the ensemble which is being optimized, not of a given of an sure, individual. Sure, those are the ones that are important that give you a transition between something and something else, but I don't think it's what most of the pixels are all about. That's not what those pixels are. Those aren't the pixels. Yeah, these are the these are the elements of the of the filters. They're not the they're not um, you shouldn't interpret them as elements of the image. There 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 will if you record randomly from cells in the visual cortex, um, you will find cells that have response receptive fields like this. There will also be many cells that don't give any response, and you don't publish data with you know non-responding cells. So they're they're called glial cells. Um, so they've only included the ones that are actually informative. But yeah, it's not a complete picture of the entire. Okay, so all cells in a field uh, had similar results about the same time. Um, Mike Lewicki uh, did a similar analysis where he used naturally occurring, naturally recorded auditory <coughs> sounds, and was able to demonstrate that the, uh, the information theoretically optimal filters that you would generate uh, by looking at an ensemble of natural sounds have a very strong resemblance to the kinds of auditory filters that you find uh, that are the, the analog of the receptive field in uh, neurons in the auditory cortex. Um, so those are two sensory examples. Uh, Tommy, are you going to talk about, uh, where's Tom? I, I'm not sure what you're going to talk about, but uh, there's some beautiful work by Tom Schneider from a number of years ago. Uh, in which you can explain aspects of the, the structure of sequences in terms of their function, but combining the amount of information it would take to accomplish certain functions. So that seems to be a slam dunk. That's, um, the, that's the start of where I'm going to go. Yes. So that's the pace. So the success story is just the beginning in that case. Um, and then uh, the infotaxis work that Andrew alluded to earlier, uh, you, you can set up the problem of having a, a, a a searching organism. In their example, it was a moth going through a uh, dilute pheromone plume. Here's the plume. The wind is blowing this way. There's the source, and uh, the the in a very dilute uh, in a very dilute situation, you only occasionally run into odor molecules. Uh, and so they were able to calculate the optimal behavior or the optimal search strategy based on two different criteria. One maximizing the expected increase in the concentration. That's the traditional view of chemotaxis, where you try to move in such a way that you go up the gradient, the local chemical gradient, or your best estimate of the local chemical gradient. Or infotaxis, in which you try to move in such a way that you maximize the amount of information that you have about the source, which you might think is the same thing, as if you're going up the gradient, then you should be getting closer to the source, and you should be getting more information. But it turns out these two formulations are not equivalent, and they showed very convincingly that you could you, uh, the, the, the typical capture time or arrival time was maximized by, uh, or was minimized by maximizing the information measure, not the, the chemotactic or the sort of resource driven measure. So um, that work is actually what inspired uh, my colleague, Lal Chiel, and I to look at this problem in a different situation in which the source is doing a random walk, so you have to keep chasing it instead of just having a one shot um, uh, trial. And I will talk about that in the end of the at the end of the talk. And that's where our counterexample comes from that, uh, that Andrew mentioned. But I'll come to all that later. For now, these are lots of different success stories. And then um, uh, I'm very sorry that, that Andrei Levchenko isn't going to be here because I think he would have talked about this beautiful, among other things, um, this beautiful paper that he had in Science a couple of years ago. Uh, that, um, Andrew mentioned that in order to apply information theory rigorously and quantitatively to biological signaling systems, one of the things that is crucial is that you be able to measure the properties of the channel with as much quantitative detail as you would be able to for some engineered circuit. And that, for a signaling system, that typically means that you need to have individually resolved responses. So if I've got a certain level of a tumor necrosis factor uh, that cells are exposed to, and there's a distribution of how much, how strongly they respond, you can't just put them all together in a puree and measure the average response, which is the state of the art until a few years ago, but you have to be able to, to measure cell by cell what the responses are. And um, through a tour de force uh, in the laboratory, um, Levchenko and colleagues were able to, uh, to collect that kind of data in sufficient quantities that you can actually measure the entire um, posterior probability distribution for the response given the input for different levels of input. That's what you need to be able to calculate the capacity uh, and then using those results, they were able to get the capacity with enough precision that they could distinguish, for instance, whether or not the underlying topology through which different uh, pathways are combined 
um, is, is, has the structure of a tree or the structure of a bush, where the, the, the bottleneck is earlier or later in the, in the pathway. And uh, so that's a, a really nice piece of work and shows the direction that the field is going, combining the theoretical ideas from information and communication theory with the high throughput quantitative measurements that people can do. Okay, so those are all success stories. And um, I guess this is another way of stating the, uh, the, the, what Andrew called the fundamental principle, um, which is that uh, uh, if you understand how to set up a system so that it is doing information processing in the optimal possible way, then that should give you uh, uh, an opportunity to understand its function in, in, uh, in a biological context. And so if you go through literature, you find different versions of what you might consider, or we've called the strong hypothesis. Um, uh, so uh, Christoph is here. I'm looking forward to you, what you have to say about uh, 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 evolution and information. Um, it's, it's, uh, it makes a lot of sense uh, to presume that if there was a suboptimal information theoretic strategy, then it would be improved upon by having an optimal information theoretic strategy. I'll show a counterexample to that at the end of the talk. Um, and uh, I don't think Ilya is here yet, but uh, he wrote a review paper recently in which one I like. I love the uh, the title of one subsection is just "Life is Information Processing," which sort of uh, is a nice example of a strong statement of this of this hypothesis. Okay, so I'll come back to this this idea later. What I want to do first, though, is talk about some work that Andrew and I have done together, um, uh, looking at capacity as a way of trying to understand. Um, uh, uh, specific signal processing systems, and we're not the first ones to do this. So, all right. So here's Shannon's uh, uh, diagram again, but in a cell biology context, if you will. Um, and the the I mentioned uh, uh, Levchenko and uh, companies high throughput quantitative measurements that are individually resolved. That's not the first time people have been able to do individually resolved measurements. Um, if you go back uh, a little ways. <coughs> People have been measuring individual variability in responses of signaling pathways for a long time in chemotaxis. So here's a classic movie by, I believe it's by Gunter Gerrish's lab from uh, one of the Max Planck Institutes from several decades ago. There's a pipette here. I really, can you see that? Maybe it's just, oh, that's better. Um, there's a pipette containing cyclic AMP. It's a dictyostelium amoeba. It climbs up a gradient of cyclic AMP. Uh, they signal to each other, and then they form an aggregate using this. And, um, and so what people are able to do is measure the, the, the paths traced out by individual cells one by one. So you get cell path, a cell track ensembles. Um, so this is work from 1989, before we were talking about systems biology in the current sense. But uh, this is individual response measure with the variability there. So there's a gradient in a certain direction, and the cells crawl more or less in that direction, but sometimes they go in a different direction. So there's a distribution in the response. There's an input signal. There's a, an ensemble of responses. You can calculate the entropy of that ensemble, if you like, um, or you could just calculate the, the uh, average value of the cosine of the difference, the chemotactic index, but these two are closely related to each other. You can go back and forth between them. And as you vary the, the strength of the signal, either the gradient or the, the mean concentration, you see some sort of a curve here. So this is an early example of measuring uh, the capacity of a signal transduction pathway in terms of how the cells actually behaved as the output. Um, now, it's, it takes a long time to do this. Uh, so uh, and recently, people have been able to do it on a much um, uh, larger scale. We, uh, my students and I got interested in analyzing this situation as an example of an information channel. Um, we built a, boy, you can't see that at all. That's really a shame. I wonder if there's a way to, you can't see the little dots. Now you can see the little dots, almost. Too bad. So this is a sphere that represents the cell. It's covered with cyclic AMP receptors. There's a molecular simulation where the molecules are doing rounding motion out here. There's a uniform distribution here. There's a concentration gradient here. Uh, well, it's not quite uniform. There's a slight gradient. Um, so you can keep track in a large uh, Monte Carlo simulation of the binding and unbinding events of the receptors. You can say, every time a receptor binds, let's add something to a unit vector in that direction, take the resultant vector of all these unit vectors, and we get an estimate. 
we have to have, uh, say, let that estimate decay with some time constant so that it eventually forgets the past, and then see what the ensemble of the simulated cell estimates looks like. If you have a shallow gradient, so initially they're distributed around the sphere, and then when you apply the gradient, if you can see that it sort of bends over in a certain direction so that there's now a, uh, a sort of coarse distribution of the, of, the, uh, of the estimates that the simulated cell would have, you're going from the entropy on the sphere, the log of 4 pi, down to some smaller entropy, and that's the information gain. If you do it with a stronger gradient, then when the stimulus is applied now, um, you have a much tighter aggregation of these estimates, and so you, get, you can quantify that you have more information. Um, and it's, uh, you know, you can, you can find a way to get a good approximation for the, the amount of information. Um, depending on the time constant you use for filtering the effects of each individual binding, you get different performance. Um, so here, this black curve is the um, change in the entropy. The entropy is initially, the change is initially log of uh, 4 pi. Um, and then uh, it drops, so the difference between here and here is the number of bits of information that the cell has about the direction of the gradient. And it's very interesting that it reaches a peak and then recedes. Why does it recede? Well, in this example, the cell had, the, the receptors had a, a binding constant of 25 nanomolar, and we were using a very steep gradient where the average gradient in the middle was uh, 200 nanomolar. So when, the, when you turn the gradient on, there's a wave of molecules that comes across, that uh, the, the state of the receptors is more informative then, but eventually the uh, receptor state gets saturated, and most of the receptors are bound, both in the front of the cell and the back of the cell, and so the cell has less information later than it does earlier. So there's actually an optimal time at which the cell should make a decision if it's trying to make a decision. Lots of the analysis that you see of signaling processing systems are done at steady state. But biology typically doesn't work at steady state. Things are moving and changing, and you're reacting to those changes. So I think we can learn even more if we take into account the time-varying uh, information processing. Uh, we're not the only ones to have worked on information theory and chemotaxis, by any means. So Pablo Iglesias um, has uh, a nice paper in 2007 where he uses rate distortion theory to come up with the optimal uh, response strategies of the Dictyus de amoeba under different combinations of prior history and, or prior bias and, uh, and then gradient. Um, Danny Fuller working with Herbert Levine and uh, about the young Rappel and Bill Loomis and company have done a, a beautiful, and uh, Eberhard Bodenschatz did a beautiful series of experiments where they used microfluidics to create customized gradients. Uh, here you see the exponential gradient they produced. The exponential gradient is has the advantage that the relative gradient is the same at all points in the, in the device. And then they collected these individualized uh, cell track data and they um, uh, looked at things. So here's the distribution of the responses um, for a given combination of, of uh, concentration and gradient. And they are able to, uh, to look at this through the lens of information theory in such a way that they could uh, distinguish which parts of the noise that was apparent in the cell's response came from noisiness in the effectors. That is to say, if the cell knew what the right direction was, it still wouldn't necessarily move in the right direction, or noise in the signal and in the receptors. So there's the, they can distinguish external and internal noise sources in this particular information channel. Very nice work. Um, OK, so uh, if what Andrew and I tried to do was to go back to um, uh, I don't know, maybe foundations you could think of it as uh, trying to, to say what's the simplest, what are the simplest elements that comprise a signal, a, a channel that is part of a signal transduction process that we can analyze rigorously. Um, so at a minimum, there's two or maybe three steps to any sort of signal transduction channel that are running in series. First, uh, if there's a sending cell, it has to secrete, it has to decide what the, sig the, what the signal is going to be, and it secretes the signaling molecules, and that secretion is itself a random process. Then the molecules have to diffuse through space or get carried by the bloodstream one way or another to wherever they're going to be received. And that diffusion process is 
inherently noisy. And then once you are at the, uh, in the vicinity of the receptor, you have to bind and interact with the, with the receptor. And that process also has uh, noise associated with it. So I don't know why this is showing up so hard to see. There's a sine wave here. Let's pretend you can all see the sine wave. That's the time-varying secretion rate that's going to carry the signal. This, which you can probably see better, is uh, the results. If there's a counting box around the receiver cell, then there's sort of a lagged uh, and attenuated version of that sine wave, which has discrete counting noise in it. And then the actual state of the receptor, if you look at a single receiver molecule, it's either bound or unbound, and that's flipping up and down. So this is what the cell would see. Somehow it's trying to infer this, or maybe this, from that very noisy discrete signal. And uh, we, were, we were interested in, so clearly there's, there's some sort of a communications channel you can find there, and we were interested in how much can we say about its capacity. So Peter, do you, do you think that the secretion diffusion is sort of unidirectional, or that there's some way to direct it where you, most of it where you want it to go? No, it's horribly inefficient, and it goes everywhere. Right. Yeah. I mean, this is why it's a great idea. That, this is why nerve cells were such a great invention, right? Because then you can send uh, a signal to another cell instead of to everybody. Nevertheless, we have lots of, I don't know, lots of the old operating system is still there. And we have lots of processes that depend on diffusion-mediated uh, signaling as well. All right. So I'm going to we decided to focus on uh, just the binding process. And that's what I'll talk about next. So um, even if you just look at the molecules, the proteins that bind to signaling molecules and then uh, transduce that signal, to affect things happening inside the cell, things are still very, very complicated uh, most of the time. Um, so typically, you've got some sort of a graph, a network with s different states. I should have found a pointer before I did this. Here we go. All right. So we have the num uh, a finite set of states, and then depending on the concentration of the signal. Uh, the states might be different amounts of molecule that are bound, for instance. So um, you make transitions then between different states in a way that's driven by the concentration. So if I use pK to represent the probability of being in the kth state, then the prob those probabilities would evolve according to a chemical master equation. Just a, it's just a non-homogeneous uh, continuous time Markov process. And here's a couple of examples you can find in, in the literature of these rather complicated graphs. These are actually quite simplified from the original systems. Um, what we're going to look at instead is the second simplest possible version of this, in which we have a graph with two nodes, a network with two nodes, uh, two states for the receptor, and then we're making transitions back and forth between those two states in a way that is driven by the signal. Um, you might ask, what is the simplest thing if this is the second simplest, and I'll tell you that a little bit later. Um, so what we've got here is a concentration of uh, the signaling molecule. If the receptor is in the unbound state, which I'll call U, then it makes a transition to the bound state with uh, a rate or a per time step probability, if you will. Um, alpha, which is dependent on the concentration, typically just proportional to the concentration. Once it's bound, it makes a transition back with, probability, with uh, rate beta. That rate is independent of the concentration. So now we have a process which is sensitive when it's in one state, but insensitive when it's in another state. And this is the, the fundamental difficulty, but also the, the, the opportunity for, for, doing, for looking at a, a novel kind of channel. All right, so in this 1D case, if P is the probability of being bound, the master equation just reduces to a single scalar linear non-homogeneous equation. Um, we have rate constants for the, the binding and unbinding process. If we want to, uh, so we decided to look at this in discrete time um, uh, because it's easier to analyze there. So if we fix a time step, then alpha, we're going to use alpha as the probability of binding per time step, beta as the probability of unbinding per time step. And uh, we can show rigorously, although I won't bore you with the details here, that if you allow the concentration to vary over some finite range, then really all you need to think about is the maximum and minimum values of the concentration. Uh, if you're trying to come up with an optimal communication scheme. So the middle, intermediate values don't, don't buy you anything. So we'll have two values of alpha, the ones that go with the low and, and the high concentration. So those will be alpha high and alpha low. And what we were able to prove, um, so what, what we did was uh, we, we went and we read the literature and we found this great work by 
Berger and Chen and others uh, that, that show for a particular class of channels where th th these, are, these are markup channels with memory, so the, the state influences the future processing, but the, the effects of the memory are somehow constrained in the structure by the structure of the channel so that you, you don't, um, you can condition basically one step back and know what's going on. Uh, we were able to use uh, this theorem to, and show that, that the particular channel I just showed you is, a, is an instance of it. And by, by leveraging those results, we're able to prove what the capacity is. Um, so it's the maximum uh, of this mutual information here. And so we're maximizing over the probability of presenting the high concentration versus the probability of presenting the low concentration. So uh, the low concentration would be 1 minus pH. So, um, so we have this expression. I'll say a little bit more about that in a moment. This is just a binary entropy function for a, uh, a two-state uh, channel. Um, we're also able to show that for this system, the capacity cannot be increased by including feedback. So the feedback capacity is the same as the regular capacity. That's significant. That's not usually the case in a channel with memory. Um, and more than that, the capacity can be realized by an ID input source, which is also usually not the case for a channel with memory. So this is um, uh, the, what we don't know is to what extent these results will generalize to more complicated graphs. And that's something we're very interested in looking at. Um, so a so preliminary version of this work appeared in the ISIT conference last year, but we have a manuscript uh, ready to go very, very, very soon with the full story. All right, OK. Um, so the expression for the mutual information decomposes in a really nice way. Um, uh, it's sort of, once you get it, it's sort of obvious that it has to be this way, but the, it's nice to be able to prove it rigorously. Um, if you take the, this is the indicator function for the unbound state. If you take the fraction of time that you are in the unbound state, that's the only time when you're able to respond to the signal. Okay, so the fraction of time that you're in the bound state, there's no information. So you take the fraction of time that you're in the unbound state, and you just multiply that by the standard uh, binary channel information. And that's the value that you have for the capacity, or for the, for the, for the mutual information. Then you have to maximize that to get the capacity. So uh, the result makes sense. We can also, so this part is not, completely rigorous, uh, but if we take the, uh, the limit of, as the time step goes to zero, we can get an expression for the continuous time mutual information rate. And that has the same structure. So uh, when you do that, then uh, beta and alpha become the rates or the, 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 well, the transition rates for a continuous time markup process. Beta over beta plus alpha bar is the fraction of time that you're in the, in the unbound state. Alpha bar would be the average of the high and low concentrations weighted by the fraction of time you're using those as the inputs. And this is just, again, the binary, the binary uh, uh, mutual information. Uh, and then finally, if we take the continuous time limit and we make beta go to infinity together in such a way that at every discrete time step, you're guaranteed to release, um, to unbind on the next time step. So what that means is, uh, there's some probability of binding or not binding, but if you bind, then on the next time step you release. As time goes to zero, the time step goes to zero, this means that you instantaneously release. Okay, so now the, the, the waiting time associated with the receptor goes to zero. In that case, we can show that our expression uh, reduces to this expression, um, which is exactly the capacity for the Poisson channel that Kabanov discovered in 1978 and published rigorously at that time. Okay, so that's the simplest example of a graph as a, as a, as a signal transduction process is a graph with one node, and you're just going back to the same node. Okay, so we, in some sense, what we've done is we've found a way to extend that to you know, a graph with two nodes. We'd very much like to be able to say, if you give us a graph with n nodes and all the transitions and how it depends on the inputs, uh, what, is the, what is the capacity? Um, we're not able to do that yet, and if anybody wants to collaborate on that, we're, we're eager to do so. Um, one more thing I'll say before I move on from this uh, analysis is, um, so the, in the continuous time setting, you're, you're allowing the input to flip back and forth arbitrarily fast. And that may not be physically realistic if we're thinking about a channel where the concentration is the input, because concentrations tend to be correlated over time, and, and they can't just change on, uh, on a dime. 
So we also consider the case in which the input is a Markov process. So, so now we've got uh, two Markov processes. We've got the input going from the low to the high. And we're going to fix that as a Markov process with transition probabilities R and S. And then we've got the output or the channel state is going from unbound to bound either with probability alpha low or alpha high, depending on the value of x, and then coming the other direction with a rate beta or a probability beta that doesn't depend on the input. So if you put these four together, you've got these two together, then you've got a four-state Markov process. Because, so we've got the transition matrix here. And that means that there's a lot that you can calculate about it. Um, so... <laughs> The, what we'd like to know is the information rate and how it depends on RNS so that we can optimize over that to get the capacity. Um, the information, the entropy rate of the joint process is something that is available analytically in closed form because we can get the stationary distribution for the whole four-state process. It's a little inconvenient, but we can do it. Uh, the entropy rate for the input is just the entropy rate of a binary marker process, so that's well known. Um, of course, Y is not a Markov process by itself, but you can estimate its entropy rate by using this nice bound that you can find in Cobra and Thomas, where if you condition on a finite number of previous states, you get an upper bound. If you condition on a finite number of previous states and the initial value of the input, then you get a lower bound. And if you condition, and so you, these expressions, uh, as long as you don't go too deep in the conditioning, you can write out analytically. They only have 200 terms or something. It's two to the, the number of, uh, two to the depth of the conditioning plus one or something like that. All right, so we were able to do that, and uh, here are the level curves you get uh, if you just go to a depth of two. Uh, this line here is uh, where the input is IID. So in that, along that line, all of the expression, both of the, the upper and lower bound coincide because the whole thing is, uh, is, is Markov, including its projections. If you go to a depth of five, now these uh, level curves are almost indistinguishable. And so this gives you a picture of what the, what the mutual information looks like as a function of the, the transition rates for the input marker process, R and S. And the optimum is, of course, going to lie on the IID line, uh, since we already know that, that you can maximize it with an IID input. All right. So what we'd like to do to follow this up is uh, be able to tell you the capacity for an end-state receptor with arbitrary transitions. Um, in many instances, you can't observe all the transitions. If you think about the, for instance, the Hodgkin-Huxley sodium channel model, it's a graph with eight states and 20 transitions. If you're in seven of the eight states, the channel is not conducting a current, so those all look the same. If you're in the eighth state, then it conducts a current, and that looks different. And so you only can partially observe the transitions in the marker process, because you can only observe the transitions between conducting and non-conducting. So if you have a partially observed marker process, uh, what is the capacity that you get there? That's another important question. And we'd like to go back to the combining the, the fusion process, the secretion process, and the, the binding process. Uh, and once we do that, then we will be in a position to make the kind of predictions that, that Andrew was talking about where we can make a quantitative comparison to specific biological systems. Okay, so that's that part of the talk. And then the last one is 10 minutes uh, reasonable for? Yes. Yeah, okay, so what I'd like to do in the last 10 minutes is come back. Actually, let me pause and see if there's any questions, because I'm going to change gears now. And I threw a lot of stuff out there, and maybe somebody has a question about. Are you still going to talk about capacity? Am I going to talk about capacity? Yeah. No, I'm done talking about capacity. Well, then I have a question. Though. Okay, and so does, yeah, go ahead. You first. Um, so I have this kind of uncertainty, and, and I've been wondering about capacity. In, in the classical information theory, uh, obviously what works is you optimize the input ensemble, and that gives you capacity. Uh, I could argue that in biology, the biological system does not really have access to the input ensemble, but what we can do is optimize the channel. Um, then we can talk about capacity in that sense. Unfortunately, the optimization problem is kind of difficult and different. Uh, mutual information is nice if it's, uh, well, concave 
truncate down when you optimize in the input stimulus in the input distribution, but it's concave up when you optimize in the, in, in the channel distribution. So focusing well that you're focusing on channel because in your uh, case they make sense. You, you're talking about cell cell communication and the channel is fixed, that's the medium, and you're still optimizing the stimulus. But from my perspective, in, uh, in, in uh, neural systems, the input is fixed, it's whatever comes, and then what do we optimize? Yeah, that's an excellent question. So my strategy in starting this project was to look for a system where it made sense not to solve the problem that you're trying to solve, <laughs> because it's too hard. Um, uh, so any comments from the floor? What if, what if the uh, input ensemble is fixed and then you want to maximize over the structure of the channel? I think the crucial thing is the structure of the constraint. I mean, what constrains the structure of the channel and how do you describe those constraints? Does anybody have something like that in their own systems? Yeah, I, I, I will talk about it later, but I'm definitely going to relate to this question. Okay, great. So we'll hear the connection to the bottom next. Yeah. So generally speaking, in a, in a, if, if the information, I mean, the, the sensorial information goes through sensors, then your behavior can be modified in such a way that you actually are modifying the input distribution. You could, in principle, try to influence it. True, but, but that's what you have the In idea. a very minor way. It's not well, like not in, in, the, in the engineering in, capacity where you can pick the input distribution that makes sense, could it? Okay, so the retinal, the retinal light response is, could be an, seen as an example of changing the input distribution to match the channel, or you could see it as changing the channel to match the Depending which one Depends on you, you consider to be which. I think that transduction is actually a, a different process, which is the quantization step in, in, in a channel transmission, and, and then we can talk about other things. Right. Isn't that a canonical sort of problem? Somebody, I mean, hasn't somebody looked at that for every input? It, it has its channel. That was Michael Gaspar's work at some point. Right. But not for every input, I don't think so. There's there a class of inputs where you can represent information without coding. So it's not that, I mean, it's, it's a, it seems like a cute question. But, yeah, but, but I don't think it's for everyone. But I think there's a key difference whether you treat the input as the distribution of a source or the distribution of channel inputs. And that makes a big difference. No, no, understood. I'm just abstracting the problem going on that. What, what if you abstract it out, you have an input, what's the best channel so, for that input? And that's kind of what you're asking. So even, even uh, for signal trend, we run into this problem also for signal transduction. I think there's going to be a talk later in the week in using, in, in manipulating the environment through which the signaling molecules pass by, say, putting out an enzyme that might uh, affect the, the distribution of the molecules. And this is not unlike what actually happens in the dictyostelium amoeba. They signal with cyclic AMP, then they secrete a phosphodesterase called Reg A, which actively degrades the signal so that the next time they release a burst of signal, uh, they've sort of cleaned up the last signal. So they're changing the, they're actively changing the statistics of the, of the, of the channel. Uh, one last comment, and then I'll continue with the, was it? My question was just whether it's necessary yeah. to know the whole reaction network in order to estimate the channel capacity. Whereas if you imagine the output of your reaction network driving some behavior, you should be able to estimate directly from the behavior how well the organism knew the input. So uh, in, the, in the microfluidics work that uh, Levine and Fuller and, and company did, they sidestepped the whole question of what exactly is the chemotactic, the, the directional sensing pathway, by just measuring how the cells actually moved. Yeah. And, and so that's a, yeah, that's an important insight. But is there some reason you can't always just use that and sidestep the question of the reaction networks? Or like, this is what I'm missing? Uh, that sounds like a good thing to, to, to kick around more. I don't have a quick answer, so that's probably something good to come back to. All right. <laughs> yeah, Toby? Do, do you have a date for that Polanyi uh, comment, that quote? I really love that. A date. Well, uh, uh, Daniel is here. Um, uh, 2009. 2009. <laughs> we... we what I'd really like to say is that I like to take that first line and say that that's a definition of what you mean by suboptimal information processing. Suboptimal information processing and information processing that wastes metabolic energy are the same thing. Okay, that's a great segue into the counterexample. <laughs> so, so, 
we, we, I, our counterexample is quite impoverished, so it's sub, uh, you know, uh, we can criticize it in many ways. But what, what we wanted to do was we wanted to, to um, uh, well, we created a simple model of a world in which a creature could forage with limited information and it could make decisions about how to pursue its food that could be based on maximizing information about the food or could be based on some other strategy. And uh, we had a very talented um, a master's student working on this who kept bringing us these computer simulations he'd run and, and showing that you know the information uh, uh, theoretic strategy was getting beaten out by these other strategies he had made up. And we said, that can't possibly be right. You know, the, the information strategy should be working. So go back and fix your code. So he went away and then he came back and he hadn't fixed his code, but he had written out a proof. Uh, that, that was the counterexample that I'll show you next. And so when we wrote this up, we didn't show any numerical results at all because we had a proof. Um, so the problem is that um, we, we, if we want to understand the information processing properties of a signaling system and how that is playing a role in a biological system, we have to keep in mind that there's also what I talked about earlier, some sort of a control problem, or the way we put it in this paper, there's a perception action loop. So you're using the information to make a decision to act and then the way that you act can change the subsequent statistics of the world as it's presented to your, to your input. Um, so in a sort of a uh, cartoon model of a perception action loop, you've got some sort of state uh, representing the world as well as your relationship, where you are in the world and what you can see. That leads to uh, the sensory information that you get, the percept that gets fit into your decision-making procedure where there might be some strategy implemented then that leads to an action and that changes, possibly changes the world or changes where you are in the world and what, and what your next person is going to be. Um, if you write things down this way, you are dealing with systems with, uh, you, you, you have left the world of directed acyclic graphs of conditional dependencies and your dependencies go in a circle and all kinds of standard tools that work really well for directed acyclic graphs don't work anymore. Um, Still, you can make some progress by, by, by looking at it this way. So this is a, a diagram from uh, Daniel's paper, one of Daniel's papers. So the world causes the percept that, causes, that affects the, this is the internal state of the creature. You can think of it as the memory. Um, that leads to an action that affects the world. And then we sort of march along through time. Um, there is a lot of work building examples of these things numerically and analyzing them numerically, but we tend not to trust our numerical simulations most of the time, and you can find examples uh, where people got very interesting numerical results that turned out just to be artifacts of the way the numerics was done, and you can, if you can find an analytic solution, the interesting features disappeared once you actually had the analytic optimum. So we wanted to, to build a system that we could analyze, uh, that was tractable enough to analyze, and so to do that, we sacrificed lots and lots of realism, um, but we, we think we came up with something that's still at least uh, worth five minutes to, to talk about. So um, in our very simple model, we have a, a discrete world that's on a ring. We've got a creature that's just at some location on the ring, and they can walk around or jump to different locations. There's a food source, and it, the creature is trying to get food. The food source is also doing a random walk. The amount of food that the creature gets depends on, you can think of it as the local concentration of some nutrient that's coming out of the source. Um, and the creature might only get fed if it's on top of the source or might get fed if it's somewhere near the source. That's, that's pretty flexible. Uh, we're going to look at different strategies that a creature like this could use um, because you can ask questions about how much information does it have about the randomly moving source, how much food does it get, um, how far does it travel, all these kinds of questions. So we're going to give the creature all the possible advantages. Uh, it, it knows all of the physics of the world that it lives in. It knows how big it is. It knows that initially the source is uniformly distributed uh, with respect to it. Um, the source moves with a given probability law. So with probability x, it moves to the left. With probability x, it moves to the right. And with probability 1 minus 2x, it stays still. The creature knows all that. It just doesn't know where it actually is at some point in time. Um, what the creature does know is uh, it can observe the local concentration, and we, we made assumptions that, that essentially amount to a high concentration assumption where um, if you uh, make a measurement of the local chemical environment, you can tell exactly how far away the food source is. You just don't know whether it's to the right or to the left. 
So the amount of information that's limited for this creature is, is um, quite limited. It, it, it knows a lot. But it has part, so it has partial information. Um, the creature has perfect recall of all the places it's been and all the things it's seen so that it can do optimal uh, Bayesian inference if it wants. It turns out for this simple model that induces uh, in a nice way. Um, and the creature can teleport wherever it likes. There's no, there's no movement constraints. So it's like, I don't know. Uh, the, the, the referees wanted us to come up with biological examples of something like this. And the best we could do was, uh, was you know, ladybugs will actually smell the smell of a, of a plant that's infested with aphids. Because the plants have a pheromone that attracts the ladybugs when they're being eaten by aphids. So then the ladybugs will fly around until they find the next bush. And then they'll go over here, then they'll go over there. So you can think of this as some sort of saltatory search. Maybe it's ladybugs. All right, so the point is that we can analyze this, uh, the behavior of the system and the crucial insight that allow, what, what, if you think about the whole system with all the history and the different locations, um, there's, the whole thing is a markup process, but it's sort of a high dimensional one. But there's, turns out our student discovered an exact coarse graining of it to a very small markup process which is based on the notion of an informational state. So this sounds very uh, fuzzy, but we, we may make it precise. Um, after making an observation of the distance to the source at a given point in time, even though the creature doesn't know which direction the source is, based on this observation and its previous observations, what typically happens is that the, the, the creature will be in one of four different states vis-a-vis -vis information about the source. It might know exactly where the source is. For instance, if it landed on top of it, then, then it knows that if it's got the high concentration, that's the only place that the source could possibly be. Depending on what it measures, it might know exactly where the source is uh, up to plus or minus one. So it knows the source is either here or here with 50-50 probability. Or likewise, that there's some location and it knows the source is either two to the left or two to the right. Uh, and then it can also have, um, you know, for arbitrary, um, well, all the states with three or more to the left or right get lumped together because those all end up collapsing um, under the movement rules that the creature has. So this is the, these are the possible posterior distributions that the creature has for the location of the source after it's made a measurement. But before the creature can act, the, 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 um, the food moves, or doesn't move, depending, according to that right, left, or standstill probability. And so the prior distribution on the next location of the source looks like this. If the creature knew that the source was here, then it knows that after it's had a chance to move, then the source will be in one of these three places. In the case where it knew where it was uh, to one away from a central location, then it would look like this or this for the two state, or this for higher states. And in each of these cases, the creature has to decide where is it going to go. So now we can ask, well, suppose that we wanted to maximize the information that the creature had about the location of the source. If it lands directly on top of the source, then on the next time step, the source has either gone right or left, and it doesn't know where it is, so it loses a bit of information. So it's good. On the other hand, if it landed if, if it deliberately missed the source by one, then it will either be on top or one away or two away. And because of where it was before, it knows exactly where it is again. So it's possible for the creature to maintain a state in which it's always certain of the source location. But to do that, it has to avoid landing on top of the source, which means it never hits the payoff. Or if the creature were really hungry uh, or greedy, it could try a different strategy where it could try to maximize the probability of landing on the source, which means it's just a greedy algorithm where you try to uh, land at the top of, of, a, of a peak of the, uh, of the distribution. And you can imagine all sorts of other, uh, other strategies. Um, you can imagine the strategy of trying to minimize the, means, the expected distance, let's say the expected square distance from the source, Unfortunately, that strategy, the creatures that adopt that strategy do not survive long enough to evolve to a better strategy because, for instance, in this situation, the place that minimizes the mean square distance is here. And then what happens is with a certain probability, the, this distribution either moves in or moves out, 
And so there's a finite probability that you march further and further away until the source goes off to minus infinity, but you're always minimizing your mean squared. So some of the things that might be obvious turn out not to work so well. You'd like to ask the question, well, how do I maximize my expected food gain over the long run? That turns out to be a really hard problem. That's a, that's a markup decision problem, which to, to solve it, you have to formulate Bellman's equation, which is a recursive you know, equation that you can solve numerically, but we imagine that the microorganisms or whatever are not carrying around uh, supercomputers or iPads or whatever they would need. And that they, so we didn't, we didn't try to answer that. But the Bellman equation is really easy to solve. Okay, well maybe we can, maybe we can find the optimal strategy. Um, so we, we did not try to find the optimal strategy for this problem. We tried to compare the information theory optimal strategy with a few other strategies that were easy to formulate. Okay, so we have three strategies. Uh, they're color-coded in what follows. The Infomax strategy is red. That's the one where you try to minimize the uncertainty about the source location. The maximum likelihood is the greedy one where you go to the peak uh, of, the of the prior distribution, and that's uh, maximizing the probability of co-localizing with the source in the next time step. And then the hybrid strategy um, is a combination of the two. In this case, you, if you know where the... Let's say, if you don't know where the source is for sure, then you follow the information maximization strategy. But once you're certain where it is, then you pounce and you hit it with probability 1 minus 2x because it, it might move. Okay, so this is the track and pounce strategy. Um, so pictorially, uh, the Inframax strategy always moves to the outside of the distribution because that's where it's guaranteed to know, no matter what the source does, where it is next time. So it... Um, goes like so. The Infomax in blue always goes to the peak, and the hybrid uh, obeys the Infomax strategy in these states, but in this state it goes to the peak. Um, we limit the, the, we have this parameter which controls how random the movement of the source is. It ranges between a quarter and a third, and uh, if it goes outside of that range, then these pictures don't look like the this isn't monotonic anymore, so we just stuck to that range for consistency. That's not really a strong requirement. Okay, so now the beautiful thing about this model is that if you adopt a given strategy, then the model, then the, the food source and the creature together form a Markov process on a small number of states with a recurrence set that's going to be even smaller. So. If you look at the information states, the, the, the states about you know, how where you know that the source is within a certain distance of a given location. Um, let's see, here's the information theory creature. Initially, you start in this state of complete uncertainty where every node has probability 1 over n. And then, depending on where you actually are and what measurement you actually make, you jump to uh, one, either the 0 away, 1 away, or 2 away. Um, this doesn't mean that you're sitting on the source, but it means that you know exactly where the source is. And then once you land on that state, you can stay in that state forever. So that's an absorbing Markov chain with a trivial uh, recurrent, a strongly recurrent state. The maximum likelihood creature eventually ends up in the, either the state where it knows where the source is, or one away or two away, and um, then it, it uh, does a random walk on those three nodes. And the hybrid does a random walk on two. It either knows exactly where the source is, or if the source gets uh, one away because it missed, then it readjusts and, and it comes back to where um, to, to where it knows exactly where it is. So each of these has a different uh, different transition structure. If this is the uh, we can write down the the uh, transition probability matrices. So this is the state of a complete uncertainty. This is the state of uh, zero, one, two, and three or more uh, spaces away from a given location. And we have a single absorbing state in the Infomax case. In the maximum likelihood case, we have this trio of uh, recurrent states. And together, that set is absorbing. And then we have the two absorbing states here. So these are just one, two, or three by three uh, markup processes we can analytically solve for the stationary distribution. Then we can calculate everything. We can calculate what the average amount of the entropy is um, of the source location um, for the creature at steady state. We can calculate the average amount of food if we decide what, what sort of shape of food uh, utility function we have. And the first result is uh, sort of what you would expect, that the 
The average information that you have about the source location, so this should really be minus the entropy. Um, the information theory creature always has more. Boy, I hope you can see the last slide. <coughs> So here's the information theory creature. It's better than the, the, the greedy maximum likelihood creature. The hybrid creature is somewhere in between. And as I increase the variability of the movement of the source, the information that it has decreases gradually. Just what you would expect, OK? And these are not straight lines. These are sort of algebraic functions. But they're, anyway, we know exactly what they are. So what does the, uh, the average amount of food gain uh, look like? We, we assume that the food is just a monotonically decreasing function of, of the distance away. So you don't have to be on the source uh, to get food if you're next to it. Otherwise, the information theory creature would just die outright. So you have, to, you, you have a decreasing function of distance. OK. So I'm sorry the green is so faded. I'll show you where these are. So here's the information theory creature. Now, remember, the information theory creature always it deliberately lands one to the left or one to the right of the source, which means it hits the source with a probability of x, because it's aiming for one away from where the source was. The source can move right or left. So if x is higher, then uh, the, the food that, um, that is more likely to land on top of the source. Okay? So it's monotonically increasing with the, with the randomness of the source. And it's dominant over the other two strategies in a very narrow range uh, near the most random movement of the source. We don't really know how that generalizes, but it sort of sounds cool. The information theory creature works the best, the more random the environment is. The maximum likelihood creature here, uh, its performance decreases. Uh, but it's the best of the three strategies over a wide range in the middle. And then the, the uh, hybrid creature, we call it the modified maximum likelihood creature. If you can't see it, it's here. And so it's better at the low end and worse at the high end. All right. So are utility optimal strategies always information optimal? That is to say, is it the case that if you're not processing the information in the optimal way, you could be doing better? No, it has nothing to do with the utility. At least in this very simple model, um, there is no simple, straightforward relationship between the utility, how much food you get to eat, and how much you know about where the food is. You can be very well informed and very poorly fed, like many of the assistant professors that I'm with. <laughs> <laughs> I mentioned the graduate uh, And you can be very ignorant and very well paid. So. <laughs> <laughs> I won't mention administrators. Okay, so, um, uh, but anyway, in this, simple, in this simple model, there doesn't seem to be a straightforward, simple relationship. Uh, the, the optimal search in terms of information doesn't guarantee that you, that you have the optimal search in terms of the, the utility or the outcome. If you rank order the strategies in terms of the information performance, that doesn't predict their ordering by uh, the amount of food that, that the creature gets. Um, uh, and the relative advantage of one over another changes as you manipulate the variability in the environment. I think that's the most interesting conclusion, uh, but we, we don't know. It would be very interesting to find other systems that were more realistic in which that might, something like that might happen. Um, all right, so I would say that if you want to look at the, um, the consequences of, of optimal information processing, in terms of conferring an evolutionary advantage, you would need to do that on a case-by-case -case basis. And certainly, it might be the case in some, in, in a broad range of cases, but I don't think it's a universal, uh, something you can say universally. All right. So um, thank you all for sticking with me this whole time. Uh, I basically made three points during the talk today. Um, one is that information theory, as many of us already know and believe, uh, it, it provides a natural framework for quantitative analysis of biological signaling. And uh, it, it'll be great to continue developing that. Um, uh, in joint work with Andrew, we've been able to obtain the capacity for a very simple version of a, of a, signaling, a model of a signaling, um, signal transduction pathway, namely just a discrete time, two-state ligand receptor binding model, um, which uh, wonderfully uh, converges to an existing well-known model uh, in, in a continuous time limit. And then the point I made at the end is maybe to cast a little bit of skepticism into the discussion uh, about, about the role of information theory per se, 
Um, certainly it's something we want to understand, but you know, going, as I alluded to at the beginning of the talk, in the very early days, people were talking about information optimization and control as part and parcel of understanding the system, and perhaps in terms of the, the conceptual foundations of systems biology as it is today, we should be looking not only at the information optimization problem, but looking at the control problem that, that it arises from. And I'd be happy to take questions. Don't forget to stop the movie. Ah, goodbye movie. <laughs>